80% of it or 90% of it is execution. Everyone has a great idea, but if you can't really ground it in terms of an execution, it goes nowhere. That's Jerry Chu, and he runs a small independent agency that's geared towards social good. And he happened to be one of my earliest clients when I was still living at home in my parents' basement. If you're good at what you do, people are going to talk about it. We talk about how to get clients by strategically planning cold calls and why being proactive is the most important skill you can develop today. If you want to learn something, you got to do the extra homework to figure out what it is to be proactive. This is The Ground Up Show. So tell me a little bit about some of the, the work that you've been doing lately, like the past year or so. So uh, the past year has been an evolution of the last seven years of developing my startup. Um, because of the market has changed, what I do now is uh, creative development for companies and brands that have some sort of social good for individuals who need assistance, whether it's, um, you know, it's a give back process. Yeah. Um, Working for an agency in the past, it's always about developing brands for for-profit companies. Mm -hmm. But have I, you know, now that I've started on my own, I have more leisure time to think about things that can actually make an impact on people. Whether it's empowering them, whether it's giving back in a f uh, funding donation kind of way, or even teaching the new um, young minds uh, what they can do with their lives. Yeah, I think that that could certainly be difficult working in the agency world where generally it's not about the greater good and it's more about um, the bottom line. And these companies, all they really care about are, are profits and clicks and views. Mm -hmm. um, so that's nice. Like, what, what, what are some of the projects and, and the organizations that you've been working with in terms of kind of that, that give back philosophy? For sure. I mean, I think... Uh... In anything that you do, you have to remain authentic. A lot of the nonprofits uh, or things that I'm involved with are actually activities that I find passion in. So there are nonprofits like uh, I used to be an active uh, skate skate blader. Um, I used to do a lot of snowboarding. So a lot of those activities kind of embedded myself into the culture of my community. So I've been involved with Stoked. Dot org, mm -hmm. which is a, a youth activation program that teaches kids basically about entrepreneurship. And the, a lot of these kids don't have the funds or the mentors to actually take them on a mountain or uh, teach them how to skateboard. And so what do we do is we create curriculum for them that actually teaches them how to make a skateboard, sell the skateboard to local communities so that they could fund their wow. own trips to go to the mountain. That's so and then cool. we teach them how to snowboard or skateboard. And a lot of these kids don't have never even seen snow. Yeah. You know what's so cool about the... It's funny because maybe this is just more so growing up, like through the 80s and 90s. It's like the skaters were seen as these rebellious kids and even people who are into metal or rock and roll. Mm. But in reality, those have some of the, the tightest knit communities. Once I became friends with some skaters and, and bladers, like it, they very much... It's some of the most supportive people that you'll meet. Yeah, 100%. I think, you know, in the beginning, like anything else, there are cliques. Uh, when blading came into the scene, it was always seen as the outcast um, mm. because it was it was kind of new, whereas skateboarding has always been there and started creating and laying a foundation. Um, but once when, you know, you stuck through it, a lot of the skateboarders in that community also see, you know, saw um, how rugged you were into it. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, when you bleed, everyone bleeds, you know? Mm. And when you make a trick happen because you don't give up, they give you respect for that. Yeah, even if to, to try it. And I do, because yeah. I, I had actually uh, bladed a little bit because I couldn't skate. Skateboard is like a bit of a steeper curve to get into. I think rollerblading is a little bit easier for me to wrap my head around. But I remember like around 10 or 12 going to a skate park with my cousin. And he was very good. I was not. Mm -hmm. I had never gone down like a five foot ramp before, even a three foot ramp. And then to get up there and to go down a five foot ramp for the first time after just like learning how to skate, um, people give you like a lot of credit and respect because I fell right on my ass. Oh, <laughs> like, yeah. I went right down. <laughs> like I, I think I still have a scar from that day. Oh, yeah. But like they, they, they do have like they give you so much support for failing. Oh, yeah. I mean, they'll even guide you in terms of you know how to do it. I think that the community of action sports has always been about teaching because at the end of the day, you're going to fall. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everyone wants to figure out how to do it because no one's ever kind of pioneered that. 
Mm-hmm. You know, if you're gonna do something and fall off the ledge, it's not like you might know the routine, but at the same time, it's a new trick. So every every yeah. kind of endeavor is a new opportunity to either succeed or fail. Yeah, and you're gonna fail a lot. Exactly. Because like, it is it's very much muscle memory. So oh, the only totally. way to learn is to just keep doing it. Totally. I mean, you know, with all the videos, the skate videos or action sports videos of snowboarding, you know, you get that one shot, That's right? Funny. And everyone sees these um, collective views of all these successful attempts. But what they don't see is behind the footage where there's a gazillion more yeah. falls, you know, and that one successful. That's landing. what I love about some. I've seen some skate videos where like they do the, the kind of tricks where they land it in the beginning. Mm-hmm. And then you have the outtake reel at the end, which is like them doing that same exact take like 15, 20 times and failing. Oh, yeah. Um, and I apply that. I mean, that's that's an application and what I apply towards, you know, how I live my life and how I run uh, my business. You know, it's mm-hmm. very much so like an entrepreneur life. You have to fail at so many attempts in order to do that you'll have that one success yeah you know you just have to you know not give up and just keep on going yeah in in, in a way i i do think it's a little bit more difficult in the entrepreneurial world because it's less socially acceptable to fail because mm. it, it in a lot of ways our businesses and our, our freelance careers are our lives and um as to where some people you might be able to separate a nine to five job from your life. Oftentimes as a freelancer, you're working seven days a week, you're, you're putting in extra hours and it, it really bleeds, they bleed into each other. Um, so if you're failing in your freelance career, in a lot of ways, it feels like you're failing in life. Um, um, have you had difficulties over the years in terms of, of kind of coping the two of those of like the, your freelance life and your, um, life life yeah I, I'd say you know that's probably the hardest part in general whether or not you're you know having a startup and having to figure out what that balance is it's like even if you work at a, a nine-to-five job you're gonna have a bad day mm-hmm. at the end of the day you're gonna go home right and whether you whether or not you're going to see a loved one or you're gonna see family or you can see friends you don't want to take that baggage or stress with you to to your next kind of uh, meeting or yeah. hangout Right. So you kind of have to figure out how to separate that. That takes a lot of time. That takes a lot of trial and error. I mean, there are days when, you know, you do that. And if you have really good support system and good family and good friends, they'll, they'll put you in your place. You know, they'll either ask you what's going on or they'll say, you know what, you got to snap out of it. Mm-hmm. Let's go out and let's do something fun. And so, you know, there, there are a lot of de-stressing moments where, you know, if you have a good support system to kind of talk through it um, or you know find a hobby right go to the gym yeah actually know, that's run. a that's a great point even yeah. um like i was saying before the podcast i started doing soft playing softball uh, a couple years ago this is like actually it was last year that i really got back into it mm-hmm. um and then joined up with this team they're all great like we were all free agents nobody knew each other going into it and then now we're all good friends but it's something that is not career driven it's not business driven yeah. it's nothing we just nothing but we actually enjoy to go out and play softball and have fun and it's i think as you get become an adult you forget to have fun yeah <laughs> and then to do that i think it's going to positively affect every other aspect of your life because you're it's it's sometimes it is discouraging if you do continue to keep failing mm-hmm. um but then to realize that that's not everything that's not you know you can separate the two of them yeah and i think it's actually harder now i would say you know I started my career back in 2000 and so you know I would say that's more like the old school world where it was more foundational learning you learned from the textbooks there were there were traditional methods in terms of uh, what print media was what you know TV radio broadcasting uh, Mm -hmm. was whereas now there's this there's so many new platforms out there social media right Um, there's internet which there was classes in that back in 1990s yeah. that we were taking classes on internet. I think the the acceleration of where technology has gone and how you can put forth content immediately, it doesn't leave a lot of room to to find that balance because you're seeing reactions instantaneously. Mm-hmm. Whereas in the past, you put out a print ad or you put out TV, you know, commercial, you might get residual feedback. A week later mm-hmm. whereas now you're getting it instantaneously so what you're doing is you don't have time to process you know you're reacting versus thinking digesting yeah, and actually, figuring out how to maneuver that yeah that's right? a really great point because uh 
in a lot a lot of ways it's like street performing like street performers know right away what's working and what's not um but i think what's difficult to understand is when you're actually on the right track but you just don't have an audience yet and nobody's people aren't listening because the word hasn't gotten out about it or people haven't caught up maybe you're ahead of the game with with something so i think that's a hard thing to grapple with and like say if you get negative feedback early on from people people start leaving comments or downvoting your videos mm -hmm. or your, your blog post whatever it is it can be discouraging and you may want to change what you're doing right. so how do you know when to listen to that audience versus continuing down a path where people are calling you crazy and saying that what you're doing is wrong because of my foundational um learning and a lot of my mentors who've kind of you know paved the way to, to innovate in terms of where their fields are i feel like there are really two paths one if you're really passionate about something there's no there's no feedback that will ever change you off course right you look at you know elon musk you look at frank gary they don't they get reactions where people are hating on what they're doing mm -hmm. but they don't they don't waver mm -hmm. they just continue to go forward and they don't care if they're the only viewer or audience of their own passion then there are others who have you know they need some feedback right that's like research market research you kind of need some reassurance that you know what you're doing has some support or some some community that's going to listen mm -hmm. and i think that both are kind of true i feel like you know you you always need a temperament it's like talk about ground up right you need some grounding and that's why you need your personal support system whether it's family mm -hmm. friends colleagues that you really trust and so when you're putting out your you know first kind of uh content out there if, if it's a, sound, a good sounding board to someone that you know who has similar relationship and, and hobbies and interests that you do, and that's the kind of audience that you're targeting, then that's the feedback you can kind of, you know, um, hint at whether or not mm -hmm. you're going far right or far left to something. Right. And that, what really stuck to me about that is, is that if you look at some of the best in the industry, they have the more critics than anybody. Yeah. So if you're trying to avoid criticism, the only way you can do that is to not make content and to not put stuff out there because no matter what, there's going to be people that shit on you and then tell you that you're wrong or tell, they, you, tell you that you're stupid. So that's, that, that alone, I think, is a really good point in that. And I think even in the beginning, the more and more criticism you get, it's probably, um, as long as you're not like spouting like, crazy mm. it's like mm. craziness mm. i think it's probably a good indication that you're on the right track and that you're pushing buttons and that you have some you've said something that kind of pinched a nerve and that ha has gotten people to listen so totally. it's probably a good indicator that you're on the right path totally and and you know someone you know once i guess i read it somewhere or someone once said it to me but you know usually when you have uh any comments to anything or any reaction to anything you're doing something right which means that someone's listening yeah. Right. They have some sort of a uh, nerve that you've pinched that says, "I'm going to comment on this." Yeah. I think the right? I think the only exception is the the internet trolls because the internet trolls are just looking mm. for that that sensational reaction. Yeah. And I think we're we're getting pretty good at identifying who's the troll, who's the person who has who's providing genuine feedback or general general. Um, kind of disdain for for what you're doing oh, yeah. which is a good thing yeah yeah they're they're either haters or they're competitors yeah and, and which way i use that as ammo and push you know and that's when you have to push further and push faster and push harder mm -hmm. so you're a little bit older than me you, you said you took internet uh, classes in college <laughs> this is a little bit ahead of the game although I, I would say even for me graduating college in 2010 uh, the world is drastically different than what they prepared me for. And it was very much these mass media classes and everything was radio and TV um, and less based around like the internet was still, I think even what is this like, this is like five years, five years ago that I graduated. Mm -hmm. um, it's still, or seven years, I guess, still pretty early and, and very developing. And it's drastic, the changes that have occurred in the past 10 years. So Paint me that picture of, of when you were in school and, and kind of what was the world like and what were some of these, what was your experience like in college? In college, back uh, back in the 90s, you know, late 90s, uh, internet was just coming forward. I mean, I was learning HTML. They were teaching you how to literally put in www. It was, <laughs> that was it a was, good class. That was the class. class. It was like, how do you navigate? I mean, a lot of the, yeah. a lot of the um, media platforms don't even exist anymore like Netscape, you right. know? Uh, so a lot, a lot of those things back then were about 
the tools in terms of teaching you how to use things. Whereas now I think it's, it's, it's gone so f fast beyond what anyone could have even fathomed of how it's embedded into our psyche. I mean, mm -hmm. kids nowadays don't even know what a telephone, a landline is because they are born with an iPhone working on apps. Yeah. You know, I know my nieces, when they were born, they actually are now so savvy with the iPhone that they're teaching my parents who are in their 70s how to use uh, an app. Yeah, and I think that's the progression from they used to design these things. It was a technology and it had technical language and mm -hmm. you had to figure out WWW and all this stuff. Yeah. And then it's it's become with design, it's become more intuitive. It's become more natural for people to be able to, they want you to be able to pick up the phone and use it right away at like four years old without having any idea what you're interacting with and being able to navigate around. Um, so yeah, tell me a little bit more about the those kind of classes you were taking and what did you see yourself doing in college? Well, I was very lucky. Um, I've always known that I wanted to be in mass communications in some form or fashion. I knew uh, that I wanted to do creative development. I knew I wanted to execute them in a way where people could actually be impacted by something. Um, and so I took art classes in high school. And when I went to college, I took advertising, I took copywriting, I took you know all the traditional courses that you would, marketing, management. And then on the other side, I knew that you know, with that, you needed to know how to budget. So I had to take the accounting courses as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, you know, that started to shape my left side and the right side of my brain in terms of, you know, you can kind of have a blue sky thinking to any concepts that you really want. But at the same time, it has to be grounded in a way where it can be executed because of all the, you know, books that I've ever read or always, you know, how to's or entrepreneurial books or people that have made it that have made an impact. And, you know, they always say 80% of it or 90% of it is execution. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone has a great idea, but it goes no if, it, if you can't really ground it in terms of an execution, it goes nowhere. Yeah, that, that's what, something I learned is that you can read only so many entrepreneurial and how to books before you decide, okay, I'm gonna actually do it. Now. Right. Right. I mean, you know, you have all, you know, a, a lot of people have a lot of opinions. I mean, you and I have now, I guess, uh, you know, ran, ru are running our own ships, mm -hmm. all right, or, or sailing our own ships. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but, and we both have different experiences. We've had, you know, advantages and disadvantages on, on certain challenges on certain projects. You know, we could probably write our own books mm -hmm. and there'll be two different types of books, but within the same topic of, you know, how I'm getting by day by day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How do you, you how know? do you build something from nothing? Right. So how did you know that you were really into media? Was this like from your childhood? You grew up in New York, right? Yep. So where'd you grow up in New York? It's funny because you meet so many people in New York and most of the time they're people who weren't raised in New York. It's very rare to find New Yorkers yeah. that have lived here and stayed here. And what was your experience like growing up in New York? And is that what what influenced you to get into media? Yeah. Um, so I grew up in New York. This is all I know. You know, people always ask me that question. Um, and I think the, the only thing that separates uh, New Yorkers from everyone else is just the fact that we probably grow up a lot faster. You know, we're exposed to a lot of things earlier on in our age. Like I remember taking the train uh, without any adult supervision at like 11 years old. Dude, like the 80s, that was a different time. Too. That was a rough time, yeah. too. Like you had to watch it back. You know, uh, you knew that people were, you know, mugging people on the street. You know, it was, like again, you navigate the streets, but, you know, kids are smart. Kids are smart. You kind of, you know, once when you're kind of armed with that, you, you start to realize what neighborhoods to go into and what neighborhoods to stay away from. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't take a, a rocket scientist to say, that's a dark alley, not going to go down there. Yeah. Growing up and being exposed to so many things, you know, I, I was influenced by everything. You know, walking down the street, you saw graffiti art. You know, back then it was, it was vandalism, whereas now it's seen as commercial, you know, uh, a commercial business. Mm -hmm. um, and so I saw that and I saw the way my, my dad's an entrepreneur and he ran uh, his own business and raised four kids. And you realize that a lot of it has to deal with word of mouth. If you're good at what you do, people are going to talk about it. Um, and so from that, you realize that there's a community based system that can actually help businesses grow. Mm -hmm. um, and then you start to walk down the street further and you see billboards and you see TV and you see all of these outlets that kind of influence you. And 
in this New York City mode of where you have to live, you have to hustle and you have to work to figure out how you're going to make things happen. And New York City is, in general, is probably the melting pot of where businesses grew that stemmed from immigrants. And, you know, how, to, how you do it is not based on your education. It's based on what do you know and how can you push that forward so that you can provide for your family. Mm. And, you know, that's kind of what's changing now is that I see less... Uh, mom and pop shops and more businesses that are growing but in a good way because a lot of these businesses are young new businesses uh, from people who have learned the new system of social media growing growing it through other channels than the traditional ways of I can't afford a TV ad Mm -hmm. you know it's like if you have an idea now and you you want to grow something you can do it Mm -hmm. and that's why there are so many new freelancers and sole proprietors who live and work and co-working spaces because it's not an, uh, it's not a, a disadvantage now to not have an office clients now are okay with saying oh you don't have an office no problem yeah you know do you have the experience and you know the work ethic to get my work out there at the price that I can afford yeah you know and it, yeah it's great that that's becoming more socially acceptable because I was always very insecure about working from home for the longest time and you feel as if you're not legitimate and it's certainly changed so much now where companies will run in their entire company remotely um and if your client's doing that then why should they think feel weird about you yourself as an individual company working remotely yeah totally i mean we've seen we've seen things change uh in the last two years where it's been acceptable to not have an office, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, I remember when I came on the scene seven years ago, uh, working on my own. That was probably one of the major questions that clients were asking. You know, where's your office? Where are you based? Um, because they felt like they needed some grounding yeah. uh, 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 that you were going to be here tomorrow if I, if they paid you today. Ah, yeah, that might be it. It almost yeah. has a sense of security for them, right? When did you? So when did you graduate? And when? Uh, how did you first get your foot in the door at one of these agencies? Uh, I started interning in, in college um, yeah. because you know I knew this is what I wanted to do. I started actually interviewing uh, my friends who were in the ad business, uh, people that I knew who worked at Gray, people who knew who worked at Ogilvy. You know, I, I, I kind of again being a New Yorker, you kind of use the network and the assets that you have, and then you kind of build from there. And if mm-hmm. And it's a, it's a very much a camaraderie kind of scenario. And, uh, and so when I was in college, I, I wanted to find out who I knew in the advertising business. And then because of my, you know, of all, the, all the books that I read, I started reaching out on my own and actually doing interviews uh, with people who were either art directors or creative, uh, creative directors, and they would give me their time. So you were interviewing them. Yeah. Was it did, under the guise of like, I'm writing an article or I'm doing such and such, or you just asked to interview them? Yeah. So, you know, there was no scripted book or mm-hmm. anyone told me to do that. It was just, you know, I, I looked up who they were mm-hmm. in the publications and I would reach out and I'd write them an email and I would say, hey, you know, this actually not, not even email back then. It was, <laughs> it was a phone call. I picked up the phone. phone. Yeah. Wow, I picked up the phone. That? And, uh, and I was like, I'm, you know, I, I go to school right now. I'm thinking uh-huh. about this is where I want to go. Do you have a few minutes for me to just to ask you some questions? Yeah. Uh, and I still remember, you know, there was this woman by the name of Anne uh, McGalty, I think. And she worked at Cranes, New York. And she uh, was an art director. And she actually wow. gave me a lot of time where she followed up. She, she sent me material, too, um, afterwards. And so she was actually an influence if she didn't know it back mm-hmm. then. Um, but yeah, I started picking up phone calls and I started talking to people. And then once when I realized that, and they all worked in different departments. Mm-hmm. And so from there, I started to shape, you know, what was my interest versus, uh, you know, what, what guidance I can get from them. And, and back then, it, it kind of was a little bit more scarier because, you know, when you start out as entry level, even though I'm interviewing directors, yeah. um, I knew for a fact that I'll still be making copies. I'll yeah. still be running, you know? You still have to start from the bottom. Yeah. That's that's actually, that's great advice. And that's something that I think is, if you're in college and <clears throat> you're trying to make those connections, like anybody can start a podcast, start a blog or anything like that. And a lot of these people that work at ad agencies, they, they very rarely will get contacted for an interview for like an actual publication or like a fake podcast yeah. slash blog from a college student. 
So if you create your own platform, it doesn't take long. It take you know a couple days to get something up and running and to get everything looking like it's you know le- like legitimate and professional. Then you can go out, like you said, and just ask these people that you would never otherwise think about contacting and say, "Hey, can I interview you?" And then not only do you gain that knowledge that you learn from the interview, yeah. um, you you gain that connection down the road, which could be very helpful. Yeah, and it's a lot easier now, I think, because of social media. You know, I think that clients and um, just people in general are more ex- it's more accepting to reach out to someone you don't know mm-hmm. um, and, and say, hey, you know, I, I find what you're doing very cool. Do you mind if I ask you questions, or do you mind if I intern or volunteer? I think it's I think it's easier now to set things up, even if you're planning on doing it on your own. Um, websites are, you know, you can set up a website within a half a hour. Yeah. You know, um, and and set up your social media brand blog or whatever you want to do a lot faster now. Yeah. You know, which I think the evolution of where you know I start is probably outdated now. You know, and that's what I love about our industry is that it's constantly evolving, it's constantly changing, and if you're not moving with the times, then, you know, it's kind of going to fall on its face. But right now, I feel like the way the industry has kind of evolved, it's no, it's not about the platforms. It's about the content, Yeah. you know, and if you don't have good content, that's really kind of touching somebody or someone or something, then, you know, you yeah. hear right off the bat. So I think there are always going to be people who, who find that platform first, say that new platform, whether it be, remember MySpace, and then there's like the few people that got on there early on, like the Tila Tequilas, who necessarily (laughs) didn't have the best content, but they were able to develop a massive following because they were uh, early adopters. Yeah, That's gonna be very rare, and I think that's really, that's it's definitely a guessing game. You're not gonna be able to figure out what platform is gonna break before it does, because at this point, you have thousands and thousands of these apps and, and new, platforms that are coming out so i think that the only way like you said to actually be seen and be heard is to just create great content and continue to create it there's always and you can figure out the platforms it's not very hard to push like i just started with i don't know if you use buffer at all i just started with that a little bit which is really just an aggregator so it like pushes your content out Mm. to different sites to allow you to keep um your audiences engaged and, and keep content live on each of them because sometimes if you have like a facebook page and you haven't updated it in a year people oh, aren't going right. to follow you because you don't have stuff there right but i don't want to get distracted by going on facebook so it allows me to just update it there without worrying about um those distractions but you're right the bottom line is if you're not creating great content then nobody's going to listen to what you're saying yeah i mean you know you, you said a great point too you know one there is a you could be an early adopter and be first to market right and if you're going to do that do it with all your might, with all your time to be the best at what that is. Mm-hmm. But then there's another there's another side of it, which is focus on what you focus on, right? It's like, uh, I'm not going to pretend to be someone that I'm not or pretend I'm going to have skills in an area that I don't have skills in. Mm-hmm. So create content if that's what you really want to do or if there's a message that you want to talk about, talk about it, but write it in a way that speaks to someone that you know is, is going to be affected by it. Right. Um, you know, and I, and I think because of those two, right now, most people, they're trying to find their voice. There's so many platforms yeah. that they're trying to, they feel like they're missing out at a different party, right? It's like you're at one party and they're like, wait, there's three other parties down a block. Should I go there? And it's just like, well, if you're at three other parties, how many people are you going to really talk to that's going to have a, a conversation, that you're going to have a conversation that's really mm-hmm. going to resonate with them? Yeah. You know, so it's like, might as well just stay at one party, find three or four people that you're going to really talk to. And then guess what? They're going to become friends. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, I think that's going to be the easiest way to actually create content early on is just think about one person. Reaching one person because there's going to be a lot more uh, who share similar views and beliefs. And if you're just if you're trying to target 10,000 people or trying to get a huge audience, it's going to fall flat because you're going to be going too broad. Your message isn't going to be specific enough. Yeah, I mean, that's what I see now, actually, you know, with social media. You know, there, there was a time when everyone just wanted as many friends as possible on Facebook, right? Everyone wanted as many followers as possible on Instagram. Now I feel like, you know, it's going back to, to, to niches mm-hmm. where people want specific things. It's like, you know, going to um, a supermarket and you're, you know, you're just trying to buy bread. You go there and you see a hundred different types of bread. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it gets overwhelming at times. 
So I feel like, you know, at this time, it's kind of like if you want something and you know where to get it, if it's organic bread, you're going to go to the organic store to get organic bread. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually. And that, that reminds me of something else slightly related, which is the the evolution of bloggers where bloggers started out it was all very personal and like that was really the first social media was people having their own blogs and commenting and sharing each other's posts and you know doing cross posts on each other's blogs but everybody was really identified by their name and it was very personal and then as these blogs blogs started to blow up and get bigger then they created companies and then they were seen more as this entity either life hacker or blogger or whatever like they they change themselves from being personal but now we're seeing an evolution which is like you said more micro it's smaller and you're talking about they're going back to identifying themselves as yeah. people because <laughs> yeah. that's what people want now it's like we were not identifying with companies anymore we're, we're identifying with individuals yeah for sure and even a lot of the brands now are trying to figure out you know who their audience is i mean unless you're a, you know a, a big company like nike and the Under Armors or the Apples of the world, you've already created a, a culture and a lifestyle that spans, you know, years. Whereas, you know, a lot of these smaller companies, they know exactly who to target right away. Mm -hmm. A lot of the bigger companies don't know who they're reaching out to anymore. Um, and that's why they're always tapping into smaller boutiques to figuring out, you know, who's in a no. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're, you're pushing copies at the copy machine at ad agencies early on. Oh yeah. Um, how did you, how did you kind of navigate that world? Cause I know you, you eventually worked on some really, really cool and exciting projects. So how did you work your way through that world? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, you, you, you move and scale as fast as you want to, right? It's like, even for your own business, you know, um, you start to learn things, uh, even though you don't know how to do them just because you want to push your own company forward, right? You, you start to, to teach yourself. So, you know, when I was making copies, I knew that just because that was my role at the job, that did not define me in terms of where I wanted to be in my career. Mm -hmm. So even though I was pushing copies, I was figuring out what am I, who's this copy for? What is this assignment? And who's the project manager on that job? And at that point, once I started to do that, I started to get to know all the people I was making copies for on my team. And in, you know, most of them were the directors of the companies. So I started a relationship with them. Once when I would understand the topic, I would actually do research on the topic and provide not only the copy, and sometimes I would give them uh, my own market research report on what I found as the competitors or the industry leaders within that segment. Just slip it in there with the, oh, yeah, the copy. For That's sure. So yeah, for sure. And I would not only give it to them, but I would give it to the whole team if it made that sense. Uh, for them and so I would just slip it under the door and I would always stay late at work because you know when you're an intern or you're uh, uh, an entry-level position I mean you can leave at five if you wanted to no one will miss you mm -hmm. so what I did was I kind of utilized the time that I had to just do extra work um, that I thought was valuable even though it was not in my job description mm -hmm. so slowly as you know as I was there and and making a name for myself people started to realize like who is this jerry Chu that i always who is this what is this and and uh and from there i started to really develop real relationships that i still have uh friendships still to this day with the former ceos and presidents of my first company so that was probably the most important thing that you did right was developing relationships oh yeah um developing relationships and, and learning what they went through you know just like anything else every every person has their own challenges in a day and as I started developing relationships in various departments, whether it was print production, TV production, uh, creative development, account management, I started to realize and understand what they were going through. And that for me was communication 101. And from there, you realize every, every person in every department has their own agenda, has their own objective and has their own target. And so just like anything else, as you're putting storyboards together, you have to realize there's a beginning, a middle and an end. And once when that is kind of packaged together, we have to figure out then step two, which is how to, how do you get that distributed to the right audience? Yeah, it seems like it was really for you about adding value. It's like you didn't go to these directors and say, uh, what can I get from you? You yeah. went to them and you said, I did some extra research. <laughs> and this is like as an intern, as, as somebody who's making copies. Um, and you said th this might help. Yeah, yeah, I had to stay proactive, you know, and I think that's the, the that's the mentality of, you know, anyone that I see now uh, who wants to make it somewhere. 
Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's the passion cue. If you really want to do something, you got to go the extra mile. No one's going to ever, you know, give you a uh, responsibility that they can't dream up for you because mm-hmm. they're worried about their own, you know, roles and responsibilities. So if you want to learn something, you got to do the extra homework to figure out what it is to be proactive, what it is that you don't know. Before you left the corporate nine to five type world, what was your role and, and what, were, what were some of the kind of projects that you were working on at that time? Um, well, I would say right before that, uh, one of my mentors and the person who really shaped my career and kind of honed it was uh, a brand guru by the name of Peter Arnell. Mm-hmm. And he's the guy who ended up creating DKNY for Donna Karen. Uh, he recreated the Pepsi logo. He's done, you know, worked with architects. Uh, and one of his mentors and my mentors now is Frank Gehry, working on architectural projects. And so um, right before I left, I was managing director of the innovation lab for him, where it was executing everything that he dreams up. Mm-hmm. And he was a pure innovator. Even though he was in the advertising marketing business, he always saw things that did not live on a 2D piece of paper. He, he, he saw things that lived in 3D. So if it was going to make an impact for a brand to, to create a car, he would make a car. So we worked on an electric car and developed it from ground up uh, for Chrysler. Mm-hmm. Uh, when he wanted to develop experiences for hotels and hospitalities, you know, we worked with the architects to develop what and you know the experience was to shape the audience that was going to go to a destination. Having a mentor is so important, yeah. especially early on. Uh, what were some of the biggest lessons that you learned having him as your mentor? Failure is okay. You just have to, you know, you just have to pick yourself back up and figure out, you know, what's the next move to, to advance yourself forward, to evolve yourself forward. Because mistakes are going to happen. Um, create, creativity, you know, is quite subjective. You know, you can do all this research in this world, but you're going to have a lot of, like we started talking about earlier on in this, uh, in this recording, but um, you're going to have a lot of failures. You're going to have a lot of um, haters out there. You're going to have a lot of commentators. But at the same time, it's, it's creative, right? It's either you like it or you don't like it. Mm-hmm. I mean, at, at the bare root of what that is. Um, I think at the end of the day, you just have to figure out, are you, you know, are, are you truthful to yourself to say that you put the best work forward that you really felt was going to um, attract the people you were trying to speak to? Because at the end of the day, if I did my best and I put it forward out there, what, whatever media or creative outlet it was, and it fell flat on its face, I'll be the first to say, I'm sorry. I tried, but it just, you know, it didn't, it didn't, uh, it didn't resonate with you. Mm-hmm. Did you always have an itch to run your own business? You said your, your dad did. Um, was that something that you always wanted to do eventually and you just were waiting for the right time? Yeah, I, I've always wanted to do something on my own. Always. Uh, I've always surrounded myself, whether it was by chance or uh, circumstance, but you know, my dad being the first person I saw always working beyond all hours, it wasn't a nine to five scenario. Um, I had a lot of friends whose parents were also immigrants and had their own businesses. And so when I, you know, stepped out of school to go into advertising, I knew before I can kind of run before I walk, I, I wanted to learn the foundations of the business and what every department did. Um, so I could get at least exposed to it. I think the number one thing is that I know that I know nothing, but if I can kind of understand what every department is going through, I'll at least know what questions to ask to help us get to point B. Mm. And so once when I did that, and that's why I say my, my, my last kind of boss and mentor was good because he was an innovator in the industry. And so the things that he did wasn't traditional in the formats of what an advertising agency did. There were other departments called PR or digital, uh, and he kind of just was a good connector in terms of aligning the right specialists to each area to execute what he wanted to get to. And that is 101 entrepreneurship, Mm -hmm. is figuring out, I know I want to get there. How do I get the people in the community around me to believe in what I'm trying to do so that we can rally around building that bridge mm-hmm. to get there. That's the hardest thing, and especially when you're not thing. when you're not offering people money. <laughs> yeah. You have to figure out how do people how are people motivated? Mm-hmm. And oftentimes it's not by money. And how can you get them excited and to believe in your vision? Cuz it needs to even if you have an idea in your head, it's nothing if you can't 
get it out there and get other people to believe in what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. It's, and it comes down to you. It comes down to the idea, mm-hmm. right? The content. Whatever you're creating, if you don't believe in it, how do you expect the second person to believe in what you're doing? So you started the Think Cloud. Was this the first company that you started out of the corporate world? I did. I did. I mean, for me, it was just a name, right? I didn't know what it was that I was creating. I just knew that I thought a lot. <laughs> <laughs> right. I was just like, I think a lot. And, and for me, you know, the, the, the intersection point of the name was uh, the cloud was for me about my community. Mm-hmm. So we all kind of like anything else, what you and I do is we talk a lot, we share ideas, we brainstorm. Mm-hmm. And so for me, it was kind of, a, you know, that was the first thing that I kind of developed uh, coming out is uh doing what i know how how i've been doing for the last you know i guess 13 years or something like that when i first came out or yeah and and creating a a boutique uh company yeah i'm curious in terms of timeline when did you guys when did we start working together how long had you been doing uh running the thing cloud was that relatively new at the time uh it was very new yeah Yeah. i mean i had thought of the name before i left Mm -hmm. um before i left arnell group and uh when i came up with that it was probably around 2010 yeah 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 yeah, because that's when i graduated and it was i was living at home with my parents at the time and i think you got some somebody knows somebody in front of a friend like said uh oh they're looking for a video intern or something like that and that that has happened many times where people have said looking for a video intern and I will respond. I think some people might be like turned off by that and be like, well, I'm not an intern. I'm not going to even respond. But I was like, well, you know, I, I, I'm not an intern, but I do this professionally. So if you're yeah. interested uh, in working together, that would be great. And then we just developed a working relationship. Eventually, we did retainer for a little while, but we yep. worked on a lot of projects over that time. Yeah. Um, just out of you guys looking for an intern. Yeah. Um, what I so a lot of times people people always ask me how I get new clients and I think that's a hard thing for people to wrap their head around and for you guys it seems like in the very beginning you hustled quite a bit and you did a lot of cold calls and door to door kind of knocking, still do and you still do still and do. that to me it seems like the hardest thing um, but it, it worked out quite well for you guys and tell me a little bit about those kind of early things and and a lot of times you guys were focusing on even like small businesses right yeah. Yeah. So 90, 90% of, of my clients right now are still cold calls. Mm-hmm. 90% wow. of my business right now is pure, pure hustle uh, on projects that I feel that I know I can make a difference in. Uh, and so that's what I do. I, I, I look at the industries that I'm really passionate about, things that I know I can be interested in and really affect change. Uh, mm-hmm. And so what I do is I pick up the phone and I call them. So it's not so they're they're cold in the sense that you, you don't know these people you're not connected but you're you're no. being very selective about the people that you do reach out to because yes. if you just had a list of a hundred companies and start randomly calling you don't know if your values align with that company if yeah. if and and your past work is always going to be the work that you get in the future so if you've worked yeah. with ten other nonprofit companies that mm-hmm. have a specific vision. Uh, and that are trying to raise funding and you say well i did this on 10 previous projects yeah it's going to help you with that next company that's along that same level but if you're pitching to a pepsi or one of these other uh more commercial clients you're not going to be able to get them so like what's your process of of finding those clients and do you have a structure in terms of mondays i'm going to do phone calls or mondays i'm going to reach out via email or linkedin or do you kind of, it's just free flowing? Well, I used to, I, when I first started, I did that. When okay. I first started, I had a uh, more formatted structure probably because of my routine of working from, you know, eight to eight or whatever it was. And so at first I would have to dedicate just like uh, different departments. I had to separate my time and balance in terms of, uh, n- you know, what do I do and during these hours of the day? Mm-hmm. And then what I did was I also aligned it with when I knew clients would be at their phone. Uh, oh, okay. That's you know? interesting. Yeah. And I, I and think, what time, what are the best times do you, have you seen? Well, it's like social. Well, now it's kind of evolving again because of social media. It's just like, you know, you know, people are going to be on their, you know, Instagrams from when they wake up to lunch. To, and you're not doing cold calls and phone calls. We're talking about like emails, LinkedIn, whatever. Like I social. use phone calls. I use yeah, emails. Both, yeah. I use, I use whatever means are necessary. I think the, what, what I do is, um, once when I realize what industry I want to kind of tap into or where I can affect change, I actually always have ideas ready, yeah. uh, ready for the people that I'm going to reach out to. Uh, and I think that that's, takes a lot of work. 
It does. It right? does. <laughs> that, but, Cause that's what you get paid for as well. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and, yeah. that, and that's, you know, the disadvantage. I think a lot of people, you know, um, are probably, you know, won't value or won't do what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, I mean, my mind is filled with so many creative ideas that if you're going to steal it, I have another idea in the back I f- pocket. I feel the same know? way. Cause it's, it's like, like, cause that's the value is that you can create more ideas. Right. If the only thing that these people can do are steal them, right. they're not going to get very far when a client asks them specifically, Hey, can you come up with this, you know, a specific idea for our campaign? It's going to yeah. be much more difficult. I mean, you know, even when I was working for corporate and there was companies like Pepsi and so forth, you know, I mean, not them specifically, but uh, but in general, all these major major clients before would you know you'd sit in a boardroom and you have tons of ideas and next thing you know it's their name attached to it. Happens you know, a lot, right? It happens a lot. It happens everywhere, and I and I think that in this world there's no idea that's your own anyway. So yeah. if you're gonna take it, take it. And and going back to earlier in our conversation, eighty percent of it is execution. So if you're gonna take it, you'll still not, um, you still won't execute it the way that I had seen it in my head, the way that I know it would have impacted it in, in, in a more authentic way to your audience. Yeah. That's the best way to go about it because you can just get so upset about everything and anytime somebody crosses you or steals an idea from you, it can be a sign that the world's out to get you. Mm-hmm. But the, that, that mentality and that mindset I think is so important to just be like, well, whatever. Like, on to the next yeah. one. I got more ideas where that came from. For sure. And, you know, and again, I mean, I think our whole premise of the conversation is really about that's, you know, those are either haters or people who don't, you know, understand what you're doing, but they take it. I, I look at it as, you know what, the idea was good enough that you wanted it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, you know? exactly. Um, one of the, the best things that I learned from was this idea and strategy by Ramit Sadie. He, he calls it the briefcase technique, where if you go to a meeting with somebody, so if you get to that point where you're actually doing a sit down meeting, they're like, we want to hear more about your company, mm. tell you a little bit about what we need, say from uh, out of a video campaign that we're looking to produce. That's great. That's a huge opportunity to be able to sit down in person. And you have to know that they're not going to be the only one. They're not talking to just you. If they're bringing you in to have a conversation, they're likely speaking with at least three to five other vendors and oh, they're yeah. figuring out prices. They're figuring out, you know, what's going to separate and make this person different. Why do we want to work with this person? Yeah. Part of it's going to be with your personality. And like, if you can uh, be great and, and you're a good conversationalist, it's going to help you because they're going to be like, yeah. well, this is a person I could see myself working with. The other thing is how do you separate yourself? And Ramit's advice is go, uh, so you have a bag or a briefcase have ideas that you write out and you print and whether it's like uh so i've got that i've got an idea for like strategy in terms of future videos that we can do after we do this series we could do bop 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 um or here's three like i, I did a little bit of research on your demographic and, and where i see it going but then it'd be like oh first of all ask them hey do you mind if i pitch you guys and show you guys a couple ideas i was just you know thinking a little bit and developed a couple concepts of course they're going to say yes but you get the permission first yeah. to show the ideas then you go to your briefcase, you take out these, this piece of paper, and then you hand it to them. And in a way, it's almost like maybe biologically wired that you are now getting and re- or receiving a gift from right. this person. And they, they're providing their ideas for free. And then I guarantee you the other three to five people that they're talking to will not be doing that. And I've done that on a few meetings. I often don't, a lot of times I don't have in-person meetings like that. Yeah. But that reminded me of what you just said where like you'll come with ideas prepared and that fact alone is going to separate yourself from 90 percent of the other competitors for sure and that and that's the same philosophy that i've been living with when i started my career right being proactive you know doing the extra work you know because at the end of the day most people don't want to do the extra work Mm -hmm. because it takes time it takes time and a lot of effort what were some of the biggest challenges early on as you developed um building up a client base as you developing a business Mm -hmm. um and did you foresee those challenges like it seems like it would be it's very difficult to go from being in an agency to starting your own yeah i'd say the number one challenge you know uh, there hasn't been anything that has uh kind of sidelined me but the, the the major challenge that i see is is still the number one you know fixture is still sales right so it's like mm-hmm. still getting the clients or still you know hustling to get the job um i think at the end of the day it's still it's still work i mean even when i developed my product line you know the brand noisy yeah you know it wasn't about developing the brand because i already had that in my head of 
what I was going to design and develop, which were, you know, uh, a lifestyle brand uh, targeting active youth to stay healthy and wellness through the products of Bluetooth Yeah. before it became, you know, before Apple now. came out with the, the ear pods, is it ear pods? Is that what they're called? Yeah, exactly. And blew us away this with technology. This is a couple years ago, man. Yeah. yeah. Three years ago. Um, you know, thankfully we were first on the scene. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's all about scale, you know, and I'm, I'm yeah. happy with what we did, but, uh, but at the end of the day, it's about trying to figure out and hone in on what it is you're trying to do. Yeah. I think you're always going to face challenges of acquiring new clients mm -hmm. uh, of, and like you said, you're not always going to love every aspect of running a business yeah. for sure. And there are, uh, kind of flows where it's like, you're, you're really excited about the work you're doing yeah. and then you can hit a rut where you're like, ah, this is, this sucks. Or this yeah. is like work. You still have to put in the time. Yeah. To, yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually you just said it, you know, because of sales that takes up a lot of time versus you know and, and it takes away from the creativity because mm -hmm. what you're doing is you're trying to figure out you know i have this great idea i want i i know that it'll benefit you called x client and then you're constantly doing that because a lot of the times it takes a while for someone to really understand that you're not trying to sell me something you're really trying to help me yeah that's the hardest thing yeah. is to be able to and it's really more of a uh, a framing yeah. How do you frame that conversation? How do you frame that relationship that it's not, I need money. I think a lot of times that's, it's very subtle and it's under, it flies under the radar. And if you are legitimately filled up with work and you don't necessarily need this client, you don't need every single project that you're pitching. Yeah. I think you're going to give that off in the way that you communicate with them. You probably can, you can fake it. I'm sure. Like if you're just getting started out, you, oh, I think yeah. you need to have that mentality. You can't seem desperate or else nobody's going to want to work with you. Yeah. Because like if you're desperate, then, you know, it doesn't really reflect highly on the quality and caliber of the skills that you're providing. I yeah. Think. And that's, that's anything, that's anybody, right? That's just call it a friendship. You yeah. Know, you can't be over eager in terms of, you know, what you're trying to do. People will see through that. Yeah. I think that it's either, you know, all you can do is give it. And if they either accept to choose to take it is another is another scenario but you can't force feed anyone did you have any early wins or turning points where you you were you realized like oh like yeah i can actually do this this is actually a... mm, no <laughs> <laughs> you're like still working <laughs> no yeah no because you know at the end of the day it's about your confidence you know it's like what do you see as a success you know I mean, for me i still don't like to call myself an entrepreneur mm -hmm. i just see myself constantly working and and figuring out what it is that it can change or affect change or help raise funds for for people that I know that need it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's all that I can do, you know? Because at the end of the day, it's like happiness overrides anything else. Mm -hmm. We can always go back to the corporate world and have something that's, an, you know, an eight to eight or nine to five or whatever you want to call it. But if that doesn't make you happy, you know, that's not going to make you happy. Yeah. I think there's got to be a balance of, you know, being creative, being able to affect change, and then you know being able to live a life with with a balance that you know that you're you can go to bed at night, um, knowing that you've changed something. How do you define success now? And I know for me personally, my idea of success has changed drastically over the past five years. Even um, I had a certain mindset coming out of high school into college where success meant like the big house car money and all this, the status and, and everything that would prove to everybody else and myself that I was successful, but it certainly changed quite a bit. Um, did you have similar ideas of what success was when you were just getting started out in the corporate world? And then, uh, what's your idea of success now? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, when I was in college, uh, there were probably more, there was, there was definitely a deeper culture of what advertising and media companies were when I was in the nineties. It was the, you know, it's the Don Drapers of the world, Flash yeah. Dash, you know, magazine parties, celebrities, all of that stuff, going to games. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, when I came out, of course, just like anything else, to be in front or behind a camera was a, a good, cool industry to be in. I, I knew that I was, uh, you know, um, talked about amongst my friends as the guy who didn't go to work. He had fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, and, and I think, you know, during that ride of working in traditional advertising agencies, I think at the time, I think success was exactly what you had mentioned. It mm -hmm. was about having the stuff. Uh, I think, you know, having 
done all of that at such a high level, especially with traveling the world, working with the icons that I've read about. Um, I, I realized that through their eyes and being in, 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 um, enthralled with some of the, the wisdoms that they had told me, it's never about any of that stuff. I realized that they always had the same core support system of their family and friends around them wherever they travel the world, even though they were making an impact of getting the, the flash and the dash and the stuff. At the end of the day, none of that stuff mattered. Mm-hmm. It was who was in an inner circle that really kind of helped shape them and kind of um, gave them the right foundation to, to feel confident about themselves that they did something. And so for me, success now is exactly that. It, it's about the quality of life. It's about, you know, quality of the people that I have around me. Who's my, who's in my corner to help kind of give me the empowering words that says you can do it, mm-hmm. you know, cause I believe it, but it's always nice to, you know, to have someone that, you know, who also sees a reflection of who you are and says, you know what? Yeah, man, you got this. Yeah. I think it, it just as running a business, you have these ebbs and wanes of of feeling great and not feeling great i think you're always going to face a little bit of doubt here and there but to have family and friends who are close by who are always rooting you on and always supporting you like that's more important i think than anything because it's like as long as you have this small community of people um that are rooting you on yeah it 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 inspires you and i think if you don't have a community of people because there's certainly i'm sure people who don't have uh, a supportive group of family and friends you can find it there, there are oh, people yeah. out there who are feeling in, in a similar position to you. You just need to find your community. Yeah, exactly. And that takes time, right? That takes a lot of time and effort to, 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 to meet those people. Yeah. And, and again, I think there are more, more opportunities now where there are meetups, there are, you know, there are events that you can kind of talk to. It's like a, a therapeutic club <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, of, yeah. of what we go through because no one, no one really understands. Like I have my core group of, of entrepreneurs as well. Mm-hmm that I've kind of met through the the channels. They're all in various industries. And, you know, I kind of see what they've what their struggles are like. And we always have bad days. Our days are not uh, traditional to what someone else goes through in a given day. Mm-hmm. Like you and I, you know, we probably have 90% of our day filled with doubt. You yeah. know, we're picking up the phone call or you, you create an edit and you're like, you know, at the end of the day, you're like, I spent the whole day working on this edit this is crap. Yeah. I gotta start again, you know, tomorrow or whatever. Exactly. It is. And that's that's another form of doubt. And then right. even now, I've been releasing a lot of content. I put out like two to three videos every week. Yeah. And then it's funny, but you do get better at it. The yeah. more and more you do it, the more and more you put stuff out there, the more and more you pick up the phone for a cold call. You see these people outside of Whole Foods who are always like hounding you to like get them to, to sign their form or their waivers. And yeah. um, they just get rejected time after time. I find them to be completely annoying because my work, my office is connected to a Whole Foods. So every day I walk by them and I'm like, nope, 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 nope. Um, But you see, like, they're just resilient. They keep going. And I think that in a lot of ways, I don't think you should be annoying. And I I, I just despise that profession of of kind of standing outside and trying to get people to sign up for your your thing. Uh, I think there's better ways to do it. But the resilience to be able to keep going and, and every failure you get right there every shed of doubt you have is just gonna evaporate as you keep pushing yourself forward and improving oh yeah totally right they they have a positive outlook they don't care what your thoughts are i mean even right now you're like you know we all have our two cents about those (laughs) those individuals it's it's a spam of the real life world right like you're just spamming inbox you're spamming exactly yeah but you know what they they probably get 10 signatures and they're happy with that that's what they need yeah they have all they need quota, you know? and if they can get that that's it what are you most excited about right now with the, the projects that you're working on and looking forward the projects that i'm working on now that probably have the most meaning to me is working on that nonprofit, um beauty for freedom yeah uh it's it's an organization a nonprofit organization right now that is bringing awareness and funds and workshops uh rooted in fashion art and photography uh, to help help save uh, human trafficking. Wow! Huge, huge, uh, you know, endeavor right now. Just in terms of that alone, there are like about twenty seven million uh, kids to adults that are trafficked globally. Wow! Yeah. How do how do we prevent that? Is there like I guess what are you guys doing in this foundation that helps to um, lower that 
impact? Well, there's two there's two modes. It's a it's a cyclical thing where uh, this organization actually empowers individuals uh, on a local level to bring awareness, raise funds, donate artwork, and a lot of these ambassadors and volunteers um, are are in the industries of art, fashion, photography. And what mm-hmm. we do is we try to talk about it, we try to raise funds about it, and then we find local. Uh, nonprofits on the ground, whether it's in Cambodia, uh, whether it's in India or um, Africa, and we go over there and we actually teach the uh, some of the survivors exactly, you know, the meaning to life. Because a lot mm. of these kids and children and adults, you know, they've kind of been conditioned where they don't see any value, yeah, uh, to what that is. And so, through the creative arts, and it's kind of a therapeutic scenario here, where there are workshops, curriculum that are teaching them. Um, that they are meaningful. Yeah, and so really where your skills come in handy is to help to promote and get the word out about this organization, to get people to sign up, to donate. And I imagine a a lot of where your value comes in is that you've created an amazing network of creatives, of artists, of freelancers who are able to help and contribute. Is that right? And and yeah, 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 exactly. And I mean, I'm an ambassador. So for me, I'm always talking about it and I'm always trying to raise awareness for it and do whatever I can to support it, you know, but the team itself and the founder, Monica Watkins is, you know, really, you know, leading the charge because the community itself is more like a family Mm -hmm. and everyone who's involved with it has an attachment to really try to help. Yeah. That's great. Uh, do you want to do some rapid fire questions? Depends what it is. All right. Well, it, it's, it's, it's rapid questions. It's sure. not rapid answers. So right. feel awesome. free to, you don't have, you're, no pressure here to finish it in one sentence. Sounds good. Um, all right. So looking back on both your career in the big agency world, as well as the small agency startup world, do you, can you identify one thing as your biggest screw up? or mistake or failure that you just can't shake even when you look back on it you cringe and in my first episode of the ground up show uh i talked about mine which is like a shot a reality show and i forgot to hit record when i needed to <laughs> and i didn't i didn't tell them and i just the footage never existed um yeah so do you have something that comes to mind for you uh it could be specific or it could be just uh, you know things that didn't work out to tell you the truth, I, I actually don't have one in mind because I'm sure there are so many. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, just to put in perspective, I, I've, I've worked in every industry from automobiles to home remodeling and development of products um, to working on hotels and hospitalities. There, are, My background is in none of those industries, mm. you know, and I had to work with architects and speak their language and engineers and speak their language. So for me, I feel like it was always a screw up. And I'm sure if you ask any of them the questions, they'd be like, who is that numb nut? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> who I worked with. <laughs> yeah, yeah, dude, I feel the yeah. same way. But you're yeah. right. It's And I think it's that you don't frame them as failures. That's just part of life. It's yeah. like you, you make these little mess ups and mistakes and you yeah. ask the wrong question or um, you maybe send the wrong deliverable. But at the end of the day, um, that's learning. It's not, those aren't failures. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and that's why it's like, for me, I, I can't, I think I box it away yeah, in an area it where it's like, here's a general sense. Because I think for me, yeah. every single scenario for me was like, what am I doing? I still do that <laughs> to, to this day, man. I yeah. still like, I screw up all the time. But that's like the fun stuff because it's, it's yeah. getting better, you yeah. know? And it's, it's every time you put yourself in a situation where even if it's just a subtle failure, a subtle screw up, you're going to be more prepared for the next time you face it. Because yeah. if you don't put yourself out there, you're never going to get better. Yeah. What drives you? I would say it's it's myself. I'm probably hardest on myself. So for me, it's a, a daily a daily activity of what drives me. I, I look at the beginning of the day as a starting point, and then if I don't kind of achieve what I see as successful as the end of the day, I kind of have to push myself harder the next day. Take it day by day. I do. Yeah, I feel the same way. Let's say someone's stuck right now. Uh, they're just getting started out either right out of college or they're trying to pivot like you did from a big agency to starting your own thing. What advice would you give them to do today, this very moment, right after they listen to this podcast to push them in the right direction? I would say um, find people to speak with that are in your industry that you're trying to get started in. If you're having a rut, um, 
I would personally reach out to former mentors, uh, reach out to colleagues, um, and I would ask questions. Like, mm-hmm. what, is, what is the issue that you're having with that is the roadblock that's in front of you? There are always more than one solution to a problem. And the hardest thing isn't about identifying the solution, but the hardest thing is trying to figure out what questions to ask that you're not sure of. And that's why you're having the roadblock. Mm-hmm. Where do you think you have the most room for improvement? Everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I have, I need Me one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'd say right now, like, even though I'm happy and all of that stuff, I still do have my own goals of where I want it, you know, my, my company to be or, um, how I can help clients further. And, and for me, it's about really improving on everything, whether it's, you know, creative or budget or execution. Is it, do you have an end goal where you're, you'll say, this is the point I'm striving for, or is it, is it that growth and that continual ex- execution that's really what drives you? Yeah, I think it's about scale. Mm-hmm. I think at the end of the day, it's about making sure that you're really satisfying all of the check, you know, uh, the boxes that you have to check, whether it's even the, the brainstorming sessions that you have with uh, collective creatives. You know, being able to truly listen because like even, though, you know, anyone like for us, even if we're going through a brainstorming session and we're sharing ideas, you're still probably speaking more about your own ideas and trying to articulate your thought visually versus listening to what the other person's ideas are. And so for me, it's always about, again, in, this, in a session like that, it's about listening more. Mm-hmm. So I need more improvement in listening. You can always, yeah, you can always absolutely. do that, right? And so it's always about that. And I try to be more patient with clients as well sometimes. I mean, at the end of the day, they're the experts of their own business. Yeah. And so, you know, I try to take what I learn from every single client to every single experience and I try to apply that going forward. I might not do the best and I might still fall into my old habits, but at the end of the day, it's, it's just knowing that I can identify that that's one of you know, the things I need to improve on and then just kind of moving it forward. Mm-hmm. Same thing with budget, right? It's, it's, it's all across the board yeah. for me. What tool or skill set have you utilized in a way that you think others haven't? Um, I would say because of my experience of, of working in various industries, I've applied um, my knowledge of all those industries in a way where you don't have to come up with the best solution. You just have to figure out what solution is right and apply it in a different way. Mm-hmm. So I kind of apply that knowledge and my skill set going forward, which I don't think that people kind yeah, of Yeah, that's think a, about. that's a great point because like a lot of times it's always the best. What's the best possible yeah. like idea we could think of at this moment? Yeah. But it's not always about the best. Sometimes it's about the most efficient or the quickest or the there's a, there's a lot of other ways and there's also some such thing as good enough. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? And also budget. And you can't continue to keep pounding away putting out thousands of ideas, eventually you gotta pick one that's gonna work well and then just execute it. Cause like you said, it's not about the idea as much as it about, can you execute it? Can you, will this reach people? Right. So how should people connect with you online? Where do we send them? Uh, to The Stitch Effect. That's the name of uh, my creative agency. Gotcha. Um, so I kind of evolved the name, and so I like that name. What's uh, what's the meaning? The, the meaning behind it? Yeah, do well, you have a meaning? I do actually. It's it's twofold. Well, one, I wanted to give homage to my father. He was a tailor, uh, and so the stitch effect is it, it rooted in the fact that you know we stitch and collaborate with a lot of people, and usually when you stitch patterns together, they end up becoming something. Wow. The um, stitch effect dot com. Stitch effect dot com. Nice man. Check it out. Jerry Chu, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you very much for having me. Sweet, we did it. All right. Thanks for tuning in to The Ground Up Show. I'm giving away access to two hours worth of extended interviews to anyone who reviews The Ground Up Show on iTunes. These interviews with the producers of Minimalism give a never-before-seen look at how he created the film from nothing. Simply send a screenshot of your review to hello at mattdiavella.com, and I'll send you the private links to watch the interviews. This episode was produced by Conrad Golovac and myself. Thanks for watching.